we're going to start today talking about congressional aides, that is, the people who work for our congressional representatives, both in Washington and in the representatives' local districts. It used to be that members of Congress had a relatively small staff of people working for them, and the role of these people wasn't of primary importance. But now there are thousands of congressional aides, and they've profoundly affected the way the whole government works. Congressional aides work in two different locations. One, in the congressional representatives' local offices, the districts from which they were elected, and two, in Washington. Staff in the local offices help members of Congress stay in touch with citizens in their districts. These citizens can bring problems in in person, or by mail or phone. This personal connection between the aides and the local people can be helpful when the next election comes around. People remember the help they get from the office of their local congressional representative. But as you know, members of Congress have to spend most of their time in Washington taking care of their legislative duties. Over 6,000 new laws are introduced in Congress each session. Without help, representatives would have trouble keeping up with the proposed laws that directly affect their districts. So that's why the congressional aides play a major role in Washington. They keep their bosses informed about pending legislation, organize hearings, and just keep their local congressional representatives up to date and informed on what's going on in other parts of Congress. Now another thing congressional aides do is to help develop ideas for laws that their bosses can eventually propose to Congress. This can be called the staff's entrepreneurial function, a bit like a business executive trying to find out what products are most popular. Congressional aides promote or encourage laws they think will be popular with the public. You've also got other employees that work for the whole Congress, not just for individual members. We'll talk about these people next. We're going to start today talking about congressional aides, that is, the people who work for our congressional representatives, both in Washington and in the representatives' local districts. It used to be that members of Congress had a relatively small staff of people working for them, and the role of these people wasn't of primary importance. But now there are thousands of congressional aides, and they've profoundly affected the way the whole government works. Congressional aides work in two different locations. One, in the congressional representatives' local offices, the districts from which they were elected, and two, in Washington. Staff in the local offices help members of Congress stay in touch with citizens in their districts. These citizens can bring problems in in person, or by mail or phone. This personal connection between the aides and the local people can be helpful when the next election comes around. People remember the help they get from the office of their local congressional representative. But as you know, members of Congress have to spend most of their time in Washington taking care of their legislative duties. Over 6,000 new laws are introduced in Congress each session. Without help, representatives would have trouble keeping up with the proposed laws that directly affect their districts. So that's why the congressional aides play a major role in Washington. They keep their bosses informed about pending legislation, organize hearings, and just keep their local congressional representatives up to date and informed on what's going on in other parts of Congress. Now another thing congressional aides do is to help develop ideas for laws that their bosses can eventually propose to Congress. This can be called the staff's entrepreneurial function, a bit like a business executive trying to find out what products are most popular. Congressional aides promote or encourage laws they think will be popular with the public. You've also got other employees that work for the whole Congress, not just for individual members. We'll talk about these people next. Loggerhead turtles are the most abundant of all the marine turtle species in U.S. waters. 
but persistent population declines due to pollution, shrimp trawling, and development in their nesting areas, among other factors, have kept this wide-ranging seagoer on the threatened species list since 1978. Their enormous range encompasses all but the most frigid waters of the world's oceans. They seem to prefer coastal habitats, but often frequent inland water bodies and will travel hundreds of miles out to sea. The largest of all hard-shelled turtles leatherbacks are bigger but have soft shells loggerheads have massive heads, strong jaws, and a reddish-brown shell, or carapace. Adult males reach about 3 feet in shell length and weigh about 250 pounds, but large specimens of more than 1,000 pounds have been found. They are primarily carnivores, munching jellyfish, conchs, crabs, and even fish, but will eat seaweed and sargassum occasionally. Mature females will often return, sometimes over thousands of miles, to the beach where they hatch to lay their eggs. Worldwide population numbers are unknown, but scientists studying nesting populations are seeing marked decreases despite endangered species protections. Loggerhead turtles are the most abundant of all the marine turtle species in U.S. waters. But persistent population declines due to pollution, shrimp trawling, and development in their nesting areas, among other factors, have kept this wide-ranging seagoer on the threatened species list since 1978. Their enormous range encompasses all but the most frigid waters of the world's oceans. They seem to prefer coastal habitats, but often frequent inland water bodies and will travel hundreds of miles out to sea. The largest of all hard-shelled turtles leatherbacks are bigger but have soft shells loggerheads have massive heads, strong jaws, and a reddish-brown shell, or carapace. Adult males reach about 3 feet in shell length and weigh about 250 pounds, but large specimens of more than 1,000 pounds have been found. They are primarily carnivores, munching jellyfish, conchs, crabs, and even fish, but will eat seaweed and sargassum occasionally. Mature females will often return, sometimes over thousands of miles, to the beach where they hatch to lay their eggs. Worldwide population numbers are unknown, but scientists studying nesting populations are seeing marked decreases despite endangered species protections. At the top, you would have a king. Now the king would rule over a kingdom. Now this is not so easy to govern, especially during the Middle Ages. And the king might owe many people things especially people who helped the king, come to power, helped him dispose of the previous king or to conquer this land. And so in exchange for that and to help govern, he might grant land or feasts to other people. And the key currency in the Middle Ages, under the feudal system island. And land in exchange for loyalty and service. So this whole thing is a kingdom. Now right over here, this is a duchy. And a duchy will be controlled by a duke. I guess I didn't call it ducky, because that just doesn't sound as serious. So the king might grant a duchy, a duchy to a duke, and in exchange the duke would provide loyalty pledged their fealty. If the kingdom is threatened, the duke will fight alongside. The king would provide their own troops if the king wants to go conquer other territories, same thing, and also provide the king with taxes, which might be in the form of coinage, depending on what time and region we are in the Middle Ages, or it might be in the form of a percentage of the agricultural production from this duchy.
At the top, you would have a king. Now the king would rule over a kingdom. Now this is not so easy to govern, especially during the Middle Ages. And the king might owe many people things, especially people who helped the king come to power, helped him dispose of the previous king or to conquer this land. And so in exchange for that and to help govern, he might grant land or feasts to other people. And the key currency in the Middle Ages, under the feudal system island. And land in exchange for loyalty and service. So this whole thing is a kingdom. Now right over here, this is a duchy. And a duchy will be controlled by a duke. I guess I didn't call it ducky, because that just doesn't sound as serious. So the king might grant a duchy, a duchy to a duke, and in exchange the duke would provide loyalty pledge their fealty. If the kingdom is threatened, the duke will fight alongside. The king would provide their own troops if the king wants to go conquer other territories, same thing, and also provide the king with taxes, which might be in the form of coinage, depending on what time and region we are in the Middle Ages, or it might be in the form of a percentage of the agricultural production from this duchy. Stem cells are cells that are indifferentiated, meaning they do not have a specific job or function. While skin cells protect your body, muscle cells contract and nerve cells send signals, stem cells do not have any specific structures or functions. Stem cells do have the potential to become all other kinds of cells in your body. Your body uses stem cells to replace worn-out cells when they die. For example, you completely replace the lining of your intestines every four days. Stem cells beneath the lining of your intestines replace these cells as they wear out. Scientists hope that stem cells could be used to create a very special kind of personalized medicine, in which we could replace your own body parts with, well, your own body parts. Stem cell researchers are working hard to find ways in which to use stem cells to create new tissue to replace the parts of organs that are damaged by injury or disease. Using stem cells to replace damaged bodily tissue is called regenerative medicine. For example, scientists currently use stem cells to treat patients with blood diseases such as leukemia. Leukemia is a form of cancer that affects your bone marrow. Bone marrow is the spongy tissue inside your bones where your blood cells are created. In leukemia, some of the cells inside your bone marrow grow uncontrollably, crowding out the healthy stem cells that form your blood cells. Some leukemia patients can receive a stem cell transplant. These new stem cells will create the blood cells needed by the patient's body. There are actually multiple kinds of stem cells that scientists can use for medical treatments and research. Adult stem cells or tissue-specific stem cells are found in small numbers in most of your body's tissues. Stem cells are cells that are indifferentiated, meaning they do not have a specific job or function. While skin cells protect your body, muscle cells contract and nerve cells send signals, stem cells do not have any specific structures or functions. Stem cells do have the potential to become all other kinds of cells in your body. Your body uses stem cells to replace worn-out cells when they die. For example, you completely replace the lining of your intestines every four days. Stem cells beneath the lining of your intestines replace these cells as they wear out. Scientists hope that stem cells could be used to create a very special kind of personalized medicine, in which we could replace your own body parts with, well, your own body parts. Stem cell researchers are working hard to find ways in which to use stem cells to create new tissue to replace the parts of organs that are damaged by injury or disease. Using stem cells to replace damaged bodily tissue is called regenerative medicine. For example, scientists currently use stem cells to treat patients with blood diseases such as leukemia. Leukemia is a form of cancer that affects your bone marrow. Bone marrow is the spongy tissue inside your bones where your blood cells are created. 
In leukemia, some of the cells inside your bone marrow grow uncontrollably, crowding out the healthy stem cells that form your blood cells. Some leukemia patients can receive a stem cell transplant. These new stem cells will create the blood cells needed by the patient's body. There are actually multiple kinds of stem cells that scientists can use for medical treatments and research. Adult stem cells or tissue-specific stem cells are found in small numbers in most of your body's tissues. The impact on young Australians who are interested in buying a home of their own has been very significant. Australia's housing affordability now shapes the typical housing cycle or housing career as some people call it. Most Australians in the normal course of events are people who move through the housing cycle in a way that matches the stages of life that they're at. So, they move out of the family home in their late teens or early 20s as they gain their independence from their families, then they rent to save for a home they can afford as either a group or maybe a couple. And maybe they can upgrade it when they have a family in their middle age, they are more than likely to have paid off their mortgage. And that means they have housing security in their old age. That's no longer the typical housing cycle for Australians. Young people generally live at home for much longer than they once did. They generally rent for longer and they're more likely to be saddled with a mortgage not just into their middle age but more often than not into their retirement as well. In fact, in 2006, 65,000 retiree households were still paying off the mortgage. Affordable rent is also an elusive right around Australia. We have very low rental vacancies, we see high turnover as landlords want to maximize their profits in a tight market, and we see less long-term or lifelong rental, as we see in other countries and other economies. The impact on young Australians who are interested in buying a home of their own has been very significant. Australia's housing affordability now shapes the typical housing cycle or housing career as some people call it. Most Australians in the normal course of events are people who move through the housing cycle in a way that matches the stages of life that they're at. So, they move out of the family home in their late teens or early 20s as they gain their independence from their families, then they rent to save for a home they can afford as either a group or maybe a couple. And maybe they can upgrade it when they have a family in their middle age, they are more than likely to have paid off their mortgage. And that means they have housing security in their old age. That's no longer the typical housing cycle for Australians. Young people generally live at home for much longer than they once did. They generally rent for longer and they're more likely to be saddled with a mortgage not just into their middle age but more often than not into their retirement as well. In fact, in 2006, 65,000 retiree households were still paying off the mortgage. Affordable rent is also an elusive right around Australia. We have very low rental vacancies, we see high turnover as landlords want to maximize their profits in a tight market, and we see less long-term or lifelong rental, as we see in other countries and other economies. I think with our linguistic training we also get all this invisible training to be authorities, to be the people who know. It is part of that process that you come out as a world authority on your chosen subject. But when we move into working with communities, we have to recognize that the communities have to be the authority in their language. Actually, a woman in the class I'm teaching at Sydney at the moment, a career woman, expressed this very nicely, although she was talking about something else, she was distinguishing expertise from authority. And certainly linguists, because of the training we do, have expertise in certain very narrow areas of language, but we don't have the authority over what to do with that knowledge or what to do with other knowledge that the community produces. I guess for me the bottom line is languages are lost because of the dominance of one person over another. That's not rocket science, it's not hard to work that out. But then what that means is if in working with language revival we continue to hold the authority, we actually haven't done anything towards undoing how languages are lost in the first place. 
So in a sense, the languages are still lost if the authority is still lost. I think with our linguistic training we also get all this invisible training to be authorities, to be the people who know. It is part of that process that you come out as a world authority on your chosen subject. But when we move into working with communities, we have to recognize that the communities have to be the authority in their language. Actually, a woman in the class I'm teaching at Sydney at the moment, a career woman, expressed this very nicely, although she was talking about something else, she was distinguishing expertise from authority. And certainly linguists, because of the training we do, have expertise in certain very narrow areas of language, but we don't have the authority over what to do with that knowledge or what to do with other knowledge that the community produces. I guess for me the bottom line is languages are lost because of the dominance of one person over another. That's not rocket science, it's not hard to work that out. But then what that means is if in working with language revival we continue to hold the authority, we actually haven't done anything towards undoing how languages are lost in the first place. So in a sense, the languages are still lost if the authority is still lost. Why just burning a food item provide information about its value as a portion of food? The nutritional value of food can be measured on many different scales. The most basic measurement scale is the free energy content of the food in other words how much energy is released when chemical bonds within the food are broken the energy content of food is measured in calories the amount of kinetic energy required to raise the temperature of 1 milliliter of water 1 degree food is burned under controlled conditions breaking chemical bonds and releasing free energy the burning is chemically similar to the breakdown of food in cellular respiration all over the process occurs much more quickly and in a less controlled fashion during a connection calorimeter can measure the energy in food but cannot measure the digested energy of what we have. Why just burning a food item provide information about its value as a portion of food? The nutritional value of food can be measured on many different scales. The most basic measurement scale is the free energy content of the food in other words how much energy is released when chemical bonds within the food are broken the energy content of food is measured in calories the amount of kinetic energy required to raise the temperature of 1 milliliter of water 1 degree food is burned under controlled conditions breaking chemical bonds and releasing free energy the burning is chemically similar to the breakdown of food in cellular respiration all over the process occurs much more quickly and in a less controlled fashion during a connection calorimeter can measure the energy in food but cannot measure the digested energy of what we have. Mary Mallon, better known as Typhoid Mary, was the first person in the United States identified an asymptomatic carrier of the microorganism associated with typhoid fever. She was presumed to have infected 51 people, three of whom died, during her job as a cook. She was twice times forcibly separated by public health authorities and died after an overall of nearly three decades in isolation. From 1900 to 1907, Mallon worked as a cook in the New York City area for seven families. In 1900, she worked in Mamaroneck, New York, where, within two weeks of her employment, residents developed typhoid fever. In 1901, she moved to Manhattan, where members of the family for whom she worked developed fevers and diarrhea, and the laundress died. 
Malin then went to work for a lawyer. She left after seven of the eight people in that household ended up being ill. In 1906, she took a position in Oyster Bay, Long Island, and within two weeks 10 of the 11 family members were hospitalized with typhoid. She changed jobs again and similar occurred happened in three more households. She worked as a cook for the family of a wealthy New York banker, Charles Henry Warren. When the Warrens rented a house in Oyster Bay for the summer of 1906, Malin went along too. From August 27 to September 3rd, six of the 11 people in the household came down to typhoid fever. The disease at that time was unusual in Oyster Bay, according to three medical doctors who practiced there. Mary Mallon, better known as Typhoid Mary, was the first person in the United States identified an asymptomatic carrier of the microorganism associated with typhoid fever. She was presumed to have infected 51 people, three of whom died, during her job as a cook. She was twice times forcibly separated by public health authorities and died after an overall of nearly three decades in isolation. From 1900 to 1907, Mallon worked as a cook in the New York City area for seven families. In 1900, she worked in Mamaroneck, New York, where, within two weeks of her employment, residents developed typhoid fever. In 1901, she moved to Manhattan, where members of the family for whom she worked developed fevers and diarrhea, and the laundress died. Mallon then went to work for a lawyer. She left after seven of the eight people in that household ended up being ill. In 1906, she took a position in Oyster Bay, Long Island, and within two weeks ten of the eleven family members were hospitalized with typhoid. She changed jobs again and similar occurred happened in three more households. She worked as a cook for the family of a wealthy New York banker, Charles Henry Warren. When the Warrens rented a house in Oyster Bay for the summer of 1906, Malin went along too. From August 27 to September 3, six of the 11 people in the household came down to typhoid fever. The disease at that time was unusual in Oyster Bay, according to three medical doctors who practiced there.